Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the RIA Edge podcast. I'm David Armstrong, the editorial director here at Wealth Management. And as you know, this is the podcast where we speak to leaders and business builders in the RIA space to get a better understanding of how the most well-run firms are managed, how they approach growth, and more importantly, how they do so in a sustainable manner. Or as we've said here, growth by design and not by default. Today, we're speaking to Rob Mador, who is the Managing Director for Wealth Management at Marshberry. Uh, we've partnered with Marshberry on a series research series here at uh, we've produced here at WMIQ around the topic of growth. Uh, Rob, how are you? Good to speak to you again. Good, good talking to you, too. Uh, it, apparently, the last one went off well enough that you invited me back, so I'm glad that's to right. hear that. That's right. Well, I'm we're, at least we're... interesting to someone out there. <laughs> no, I think it's very interesting, and I think we're learning a lot. It's a, an interesting approach. The last time we spoke, we uh, spoke about growth through the research, looking at through the lens of M&A uh, and considerations there. This time, I think we're going to take a different approach uh, and look at growth, what we call organic growth, or growth through adding services, how RIAs add services, whether they decide to outsource them or uh, acquire them or partner with someone. Uh, adding additional services for clients seems to be something that most RIAs are interested in doing, to grow, and but they're going about it in different ways. As you were looking at the research that we just got back, any kind of top-level thoughts that you had? Clearly, it's a something that advisors are looking to do, looking to add services. Yeah, no, no question. Yeah, no question. I mean, we we see this anecdotally, you know, kind of with seventy percent of clients, they're trying to figure out where do they, you know, where do they expand service, and that could be just basically create a bigger moat around your clients kind of increase retention or, or it could be like looking at looking at that next level of clients. So it, it, this is a really interesting one. I'm glad we kind of partnered on it. And um, I guess maybe the one thing I'd say is like, it's, it's almost like I should apologize, but the way, the way I've looked at that and, and our firm certainly has is, you know, for us, obviously we do a lot of M and a work and, and kind of equivalent and, and, you know, consult management consulting type projects. But enterprise value, like we, we always say start at the end, but for us, like our North Star is enterprise value when we're looking at this. And I think the, um, you know, that kind of gets into the competitive aspect of it, uh, of, you know, where do you add services and, and what adds the most value to your firm? And I think th this is not a podcast around like, hey, let's talk about selling your business. But I think, you know, what we found and, and what I've often said is if you, you know, if you're educating yourself and you're running the business as if you want to sell it, you actually may never have to just because you're, you know, you're more intentional. And we, we kind of think, Hey, what, do, what does it take to get to 15% growth? And uh, I'm sure we'll kind of layer that into the conversation. But for, for me, it's not just about like, what are the services being added, but it's also who are you serving and, you know, what does it mean competitively? And what does it mean for the firms that are looking to stay independent forever? What does, what does it mean to the firms that are looking to acquire? What does it mean to the firms that are, you know, thinking about potentially selling their business, you know, over the next few years? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and we talk a lot about how RAs, you know, there was talk for a long time about RAs services uh, going under some sort of fee compression, right? Where, you know, just the same thing that happened in the asset management space. A lot of these, uh, uh, what they do becomes a little bit commoditized and uh, fees come down, but we haven't seen that, right? That that has not come to pass. Um, RAs largely earn their fees and, and, and can retain their fees. Uh, what we have seen is more services being added. Uh, so maybe a little margin compression. And to your point about enterprise value, it seems to me that the the strategy of how a firm goes about adding or outsourcing extra services can do a lot for the 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 health of the business. Yeah, no no question. I mean, it's like it's like going back to what was it like twenty tens? That was kind of where there's a lot of there's a lot of noise. If our industry knows how to do something well, it's about like kind of making noise around the thing for you know, for a, a, an eight or 12 month period. But, you know, it's like, yeah, whether it was, uh, what, were, what were the previous boogeyman? It was robo advisors and then kind of mm -hmm. the mega brokerage firms, the vanguards and the Schwabs with in-house. There's always an existential crisis. Yeah, well, we, 
Yeah. Yeah. Will, will you be squeezed out? Was it feet compression? Is it kind of larger competitors? And I think on the, <clears throat> I think it, it seems right now that it's a myth and I completely agree with you that, that the feet compression seems kind of mythical in, in the sense that fees haven't gone down, services have gone up. So agreed. It's a, I think going back to the competitive aspect of it, if, if fees are staying the same and you're adding more services, your margin is changing. And if you're looking to constantly reinvest in your business to stay independent or the acquisitions or whatever it is, obviously you have to be really intentional with, with how you approach this and you have to understand what you're building. When it comes to um, kind of being squeezed out by a larger competitor, there's, there's probably some overlap. There's a little bit of Venn diagram in this conversation because obviously the larger you the larger you are, at least theoretically, the more capability you have to add some services and hire some different folks that maybe specialize in an area. But uh, but I think that that remains to be seen as to to how scale ultimately affects this. Though I, I I know we were talking before we got on, you know, about your your uh, your latest one with Mark Hurley, <clears throat> and I think he, you know, if you if you read kind of his, um, <clears throat> and if if Mark's listening to this, I hope he doesn't take offense to this, but kind of the latest manifesto. You know, he, he and he, where, where he looks ahead, and he's obviously got a pretty successful track record of looking ahead. You know, he sees he sees continued consolidation. I think that's consistent with with what has happened. In, you know, numerous industries over the past hundred years. So, yeah, it's interesting. So that I remains mean, to be seen, but I would agree. Yeah, Go ahead. It, it's interesting. I mean, he sees that massive consolidation going on, and and the national uh, RA firms emerging, but also space for small boutique firms that offer very specialized services for very specialized client niches. Is that, 100%. Is that a, how do you reflect on that a bit? Yeah, I, <clears throat> look, I think there's always a, again, it's, we, we do a lot of M&A. And so it's almost kind of counter to, to, you know, one of the, the, one of the things I do most often in, you know, in a commercial fashion, but um, I think there's always, a, there's always a place for independent firms to, to thrive and there's always a place to kind of find your niche and serve them well. It's just as these, you know, as you go along, you have to think about reinvestment and you have to think about if, if the, what it takes to compete in that, in that niche over time is layering on additional costs, right? Expenses at the business level, you just have to be really intentional. So I think it gets, it, there, there's always a place for the independent and a niche player. You just have to increase the intentionality around your business. Yeah, so in the research, when we uh, spoke to these advisors and we looked, asked for their primary motivation for offering additional services, you know, forty percent said it was uh, to retain existing clients and remain competitive. Thirty-eight percent said to attract new clients and new new business. When we asked them the primary economic benefit of offering additional services, more than half said it was to drive additional revenue, and only a, a small fraction, sixteen percent, said it was to maintain the current fee structure. But that's almost happening by default, right? That fee structure is being maintained by default in a way that might not be the primary reason that they're bringing on additional services. They're bringing on additional services, according to them anyway, to drive additional revenue. But, uh, yep. you know, the fee structure still has to work out. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, even if you kind of bring it up a level, like when we, I know when, when, when you and I talked and our, our teams talked about like, what were we looking to accomplish with this? Were we able, you know, would we want to be able to kind of, uh, share with the advisor community? It's, you know, I think our, our first thesis was yeah, just the one we outlined, right? These aren't necessarily compressing, but services are, are kind of shrinking things. There's been a convergence. And then the other one's like, what is, you know, is this an offensive or a defensive maneuver for firms? Like, how do they see it? And I think one thing that we weren't, I'm sure we, we both could probably opine on a, a thought, you know, what our thoughts are on it, but we didn't really, you know, we weren't really able to segment out like, are the largest firms using it more offensively, and the and the you know smaller independent firms using it more defensively? Or you know, you know I don't know that we necessarily well, it was conclusive on that. But you know, with with growth being so so challenging, <clears throat> I actually liked. I, I think when I was reading through, my, one of my takeaways is that either the advisor community is sane and they, and they agree with me, or I'm I'm saying I agree with the, the advisor community, like. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are thinking about outsourcing and then, and then, um, you know, I think they're, they're, it appears they're thinking about things around kind of their client niche, like what do our, what do our clients actually need? Yeah. I mean, that uh, notion of knowing your client and knowing what the client needs is probably the, the baseline anyway, for figuring out how to do some of this stuff. You know, some of the, uh, you want to talk a little bit about some of the services that uh, folks are offering and, and, you know, when you're yeah. out there, your clients. You know, what are some of the, uh, yeah, the services that they're looking to uh, get into? I think 
you know, in our survey, we found yep. uh, trust and estate planning was a big one. You know, bringing in uh, business owner services uh, was a big one. Uh, insurance and risk management, also a big one. What is that jive with what you're talking when you're out there talking to clients on the road? Yeah, the, uh, 100%. And I think it's, it, it's interesting to see it in the data, especially on insurance. And we've naturally, I'm sure you've seen as much as I have, like there's been, there's kind of a convergence of, of multiple different areas, you know, surrounding a client's financial life. And it's, you know, it's obviously the planning and investment management, but then there's maybe, you know, retirement plans, right? At their convergence with kind of the retirement consulting world. And then, and then obviously insurance as well, which, you know, it's almost <clears throat> when you say insurance to a, to an RIA that, has kind of purely done fee-based planning, you know, that could be a four letter word, but it is interesting to see in the data that, you know, more firms are thinking about how do we, you know, more holistically serve our clients and look at insurance, you know, when it comes to the, the, the business owner services, I think that's natural, right? At, at, you said it, like when you were thinking about expanding, you know, your services, the first thing you need to do is it's just like when you look at your fees and you're trying to kind of optimize your operational model, if you, you have to, go internal and, and look at your clients, which many, you know, many of the business owners we work with haven't done in 10 years or maybe ever and say like, who is our actual client? What do their assets look like? You know, where are they in their life stages? You know, what services we need to add? And I think more often than not, as a, uh, I'm sure the majority of listeners would agree, you know, you find, Hey, I want to work with business owners. Uh, they're going through, you know, they're going through similar things as, as our industry is right with, succession and, and a lot of free capital in the space, kind of looking to make investments and um, a, lot, a number of large aggregators, not just in, obviously not just in wealth, but it's in you know, all, all sorts of different industries. So business owner services are, are kind of that, you know, one of the most natural ways to expand your services and tie yourself out of the client and then also position to be, you know, there when there's kind of money in motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, when you're talking to your clients about doing this kind of stuff and, and assuming that they know their client niche and, and they know maybe the best service to bring in to access, how do you guide them around the conversation around whether to outsource the service or to bring it in-house mm -hmm. partnership or acquisition? Yeah. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of like the, the build by partner, mm -hmm. right? Like in the, in the tech world, right, David? Yep. Um, yep. You know, where you have to decide like what's, what would actually make sense to invest in versus what we, what we partner on. <clears throat> and I think the first thing, which we already covered is who's, who's your client, right? The second is, and, and probably even, even, you know, equally important is where are you going, right? Stephen Covey, start with the end in mind. Like what, what is, what is your firm trying to build? Uh, are you looking, I, I guess to use kind of M and A terminology, uh, you know, it's like, are, are you looking in, in three or five or 10 years or 15 years, whatever it is, are, do you want to be the roller or do you want to be the rolly, right? Do you want to build the, the infrastructure to be a true platform where it actually makes sense to invest and you'll, you'll see your, you know, your free cash flow and, you know, maybe your, the distributions are taken out of the business kind of shrink, but over, over the long haul, it's the, it's the old, you know, I'd rather have, um, you know, a, a large slice of a watermelon than an entire grape. So it makes sense to invest in some of these things if you're trying to be a platform especially if you're looking to compete. There was actually a study, you know, there's a, there was an article that came out around the study. I think it was actually earlier today, maybe it was last night. <clears throat> and it was talking about in the M&A sense, like well, what leads to deal satisfaction and, and kind of the, the converse of what leads to people being dissatisfied. And one of the things that I found most interesting was it's primarily tied to being able to deliver on kind of the, the growth opportunities and the additional services. And so <clears throat> if you're a platform or you're trying to build a platform, clearly you got to pay specific attention to, to which services you add, <clears throat> where you invest, and then the ability to actually deliver them with some scale. So that, that's when you'd say, Hey, bring it in house. Now, if you're, you know, if you're not sure that you want to ultimately be a platform and have to kind of get to that large scale, you know, there, it, it probably makes less sense to, to bring it in house because it's not going to necessarily add a ton of enterprise value. Again, going back to that North star. So, so it's, it, you know, it really it, it kind of, you have to understand what you're, what you're trying to get to and what you're trying to build and what you and your partners ultimately are, are creating within your firm. And that should, that's a good lens to look at first off, like where do we add? 
We invite you to join us on May 13th through 16th in Hollywood, Florida for RA Edge, part of the Wealth Management Edge event. With an agenda designed to help accelerate the growth of your RAA firm with the latest C-suite strategies, you'll walk away with frameworks and approaches for M&A, organic growth, and talent development. Use promo code PODCAST20 to save 20% on your registration. Visit wealthmanagementedge-event.com for more information. Yeah, yeah. I I imagine that they're probably, for each firm has a different uh, answer to this, but uh you know, when do you kind of uh, hit that point where you make that decision that, oh yeah, we're, we're more of a platform now we, you know, we're, we've evolved into that um, versus still trying to, to, to run the firm as a, as a, as a practice. The, I think when folks make this distinction between in-house and outsourcing um, it seems mm-hmm. in, our, in the research that we did anyway, that the stuff that they outsource the most currently is the stuff that they find the greatest growth in. So trust, preparation, uh, estate planning, you know, philanthropic planning, insurance risk management. Uh, you know, they tend to outsource this more than uh, have it in house, according to our respondents. Yet they find the most value there. A- any thoughts on why that is? Is that um, well? A- should we look for a wave of ahead. those services being brought in house now, as, or what? What do you uh, thought? You know, uh, well, well, I'll I'll take you back just one step to enterprise value, um, and then kind of dig into these individual kind of it, we'll call them most popular per the data. Mm-hmm. Like on the enterprise value side, I think when you when you look across this, you know, I think tax was kind of up there as one of the um, yeah you know, one of the most outsourced and. Mm-hmm. Obviously, taxes, you know, that's probably one of the conversations I have most with RA firms. Like, hey, should we be thinking about adding tax? Should we buy a tax practice? Should we partner with a tax practice? You know, should we build it in-house? <clears throat> and I think that the, the reason I, I kind of put that under the guise of, like, enterprise value is the, the exercise we'd go through is what is what's actually adding to your enterprise value and what's not. And, and oftentimes, more often than not, like the – because tax doesn't necessarily have the same type of multiple as, you know, as wealth management firms, fee, you know, primarily fee-based wealth management firms. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might not actually make sense to have that under your umbrella unless you are trying to make that something that attracts other advisors to partner with you or, you know, to, to say, hey, this is the firm I want to sell to. So, <clears throat> so I think that that's on the enterprise value. I think that's how we think about it too, just to add a layer of color there. In regards to kind of those top services, like I, I would actually pose the the question to you, and then I'll kind of layer in my own thoughts too. But I mean, do do you see a common thread in here as far as like difficulty of of being able to provide it, and maybe even like um, you know uh, compliance or or kind of risk? Yeah, I mean risk. I think certainly, um, I, you know, from a, a fiduciary point of view, of course. The, uh, in, but yeah, it's it's. I think what we see is a lot of the more, I don't want to call it higher level, maybe uh, financial planning, uh, a lot of the estate planning, trust services, um, philanthropic planning seems to be popular. You know, we do see, I think, advisors bringing this stuff in-house more and more. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, we have here, uh, we note that there's a concierge services is something that uh, advisors don't look to as as much, but you know, we we see this too, right? With a lot of firms becoming a you know a wealth or health proxies for for their clients. I mean, just moving into you know other areas of the client's life uh, requires some of these other services, right? You know, yeah. how do you do a multi generation without doing some philanthropic planning, without doing legacy building? Uh, you know, it all it all ties together. Yep, and I think there's a you know for me when I look at it, I think about like what's the what kind of scale do you need to be effective in these particular areas? Right. Like, do you, is, is it a service that you can hire one person that's kind of a specialist and have them capably serve an entire book or an enterprise if you're a larger firm? And then kind of what's the, what's the risk element of it? Like, you know, not to make everything about lawsuits, but it's like, what are the chances we get sued for providing this kind of thing? Or mm-hmm. is there a complexity? Or, and, and when I look at those, I think it's probably, there's, there's a lot of scale, you know, needed to be effective in some of these areas, especially like tax, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you do, and I know there's, we could probably go on for, for another hour about kind of the, the merits of tax prep versus tax planning, you know, which you actually want to bring in house and which you may not want to just cause it's kind of, kind of rate limited, uh, by, by 
you know, the number of, yeah, the number of bodies you have. But when I think about it and, and I look at that, I think, I think firms are acting pretty rationally here uh, in, in thinking about like, Hey, it probably makes sense to just partner with someone and not bring it in house, you know, because it, the other aspect of bringing it in house is there's, there's a, there's a client experience, right? Now your name's on the door for that service. You can't, if, if you're not providing it with quality and, and timeliness, uh, now, it's, now it's your name. That's, um, you know, it's got a little black mark next to it. Uh, you can't, you, you can't fire your internal team and not look bad. You know, you can recommend a client uh, as kind of QB to your client. You can kind of recommend they fire someone else if they're not performing. So, um, yeah. so that's yeah. when I look at that, that's, that's kind of what I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It sounds like what you're saying is that uh, most firms are probably better off outsourcing uh, a lot of these services uh, unless they're trying to really build a kind of a growth platform uh, that they have ambitious plans to scale over the coming years. Is that hundred percent? Yeah, I think that's that's a, a nice succinct way of putting it. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, some of the other stuff that we uh, looked at here, which I thought was really interesting, um, we asked uh, uh, folks that the services that uh, pose the most significant threat to the business if they were unable to offer it over the next one to two years. So these are you know, we talked about the existential threats that RAs are always under. You know, these are uh, services that these RAs said that uh, would be a threat to their business if they were unable to offer in the next one to two years. And uh, the top one here is technology, right? Digital advice, investment selection, um, client communication. So getting the tech technology game right is, uh, you know, probably job number one in terms of if you're going to go try to outsource something, you know, and you don't have the technology right. Uh, maybe that's the place to start more than any of these other services, correct? Yeah, and I, I, I'd kind of put that under the growth bucket, right? Like we, we, like we said, you know, we always talk about fifteen percent as kind of that hallmark, uh, because you can, and it's not, it's not just about saying like, oh, let's just pick a number. It's, you know, that's where you can actually be reinvesting in the business, provide a path for your employees to keep growing, and 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 have that kind of upward trajectory. You can kind of manage some of the regulatory side. And so when, when I see technology, especially when digital advice is kind of up there, I see that as like client experience and thinking about the, you know, the next generation of clients. Right? Another thing that, that, that I agree, again, if there's a recency bias here, but seeing as I just listened to your podcast with Mark Hurley, right, it, he talked a little bit about, you know, you need to find that, that next client that's going to be with you for another 40 years or your firm does. And, um, I think client preferences are changing. You know, there's no, there's no doubt about it. Like um, the way you service clients is different. The way you communicate with clients is a little different. If you're part of that's a generational part of that's kind of maybe even driven by kind of COVID and how we all shifted virtual for a while, you know, but for me, that, that just sounds like, Hey, I, I am afraid as a business owner or team of, of partners, you know, we're afraid that if, if we can't figure out how to, to best serve that next generation client in the way that they want to be served, we're gonna have a hard time growing and competing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, that jives with the the next two here that they see a, a significant threat if they're unable to offer in trust and estate planning and business owner services, retirement investment banking, succession services, those kinds of things. So yeah, for for next gen clients and and you know that, yep. that makes some sense. You know, any well, other? It, it is interesting too. You talk you talk trust and estate, and then you talk business owner, <clears throat> and then you talk digital advice, like the digital advice. You know, technology side kind of think it sounds to me like how do we serve the future, and then the trust the state business over over services are almost uh, like how do we serve the current uh, you mm -hmm. know clients where you know wh where they are in their life cycle, you know their age and and um, you know what they're doing in their life. So it, again, I see it as rational. It kind of it it's nice to add it's nice to add some data to to you know I would say our our theses. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, that's that's what I see is businesses that are trying to serve their current clients, and that, but they're they're more worried about the future. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that we spoke about uh, uh, when we were discussing this research earlier, <clears throat> you said that you had a observation of a lot of uh, firms. You called it service creep. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, you know firms that are starting to kind of bleed into other services, not intentionally or. Or, you know, yep. or because they feel they have to. I don't know what 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 did you mean by that? What do you, what do you see from? Yeah, doing? I mean, I think I think that that probably wraps the entire conversation of today. Is, you know, it's like there's service creep in the industry, and then there's service creep within individual firms. 
like the if, if you look at this data and i hope everyone who listens is able to download it the um you know the one thing that i've found like i guess it, it's it's helpful and it's not at the same time which is there is no black and white right there's not a there wasn't like a clear cut winner in what services are we adding or why are we doing it uh, so there's no like there's no roadmap like here's what you add first and here's what you add second it's going to be a little ad hoc and kind of you know unique to each firm but when it, when, when you think about service creep to um, within an individual business like i almost um, i almost liken it to and i hope that there's probably a psychologist on here that's going to tell me I, i'm completely doing doing this wrong or misrepresenting but I think it's called a Dunning Kruger effect, right? Which is like I'd almost like term it as like the official diagnosis of of founder syndrome. Mm. Which is if you if you're really good, like if you've built a really successful business, you're great at serving clients, you know, whatever it is. If you think if if you're really good in one area, even in an area where you might not be as good, you 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 know, you just think you're gonna be excellent at it. Uh and so that in an individual firm like the service creep is kinda like Hey, heck! I built this. I built this great firm. I got a great client base. I got a great team. Of course, I'm going to be excellent at tax. Of course, I can do. I, of course, I can get into philanthropic. You know, of course, we can get into concierge. So it's, it's um, to me, that's the the service creep internally. And I think if you're not if you're doing that and you're not looking at like what is this doing, you know, in our financial statement, is this actually adding value to clients? It's, you know, it's almost like a, it's it's almost like what's the next shiny object. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, you know, as, as we've seen in, in all of the research, I think that we've done with you all, it's that it, it's like you said, no black and white answer for, you know, all firms are different, but it's the intentionality with which to set yeah. off um, the path. And it's, and hey, but David, how, how much easier would it be if it was black and white? <laughs> right. No, I know exactly. Uh, this would have been a, this would have been an easy interview if we had, uh, yeah, all right. if, mm-hmm. if, if, if it was ex- exceptionally binary. Yeah, and then the, then the, the algorithms would tell us. AI will tell us how to grow mm-hmm. our business. Exactly. It was has been great, Rob. Uh, thanks very much. We're we're yeah. at the at the time. I, I hope folks uh, do find the research. It's on our website. Research that we've done with a uh, financial services consultancy, Marsh Berry, uh, and Rob Medor, managing director for wealth management. Yeah. Thanks very much for being with us. Of course, appreciate you having me, Dave. And this has been the RA Edge podcast. I'm David Armstrong. Thank you for listening. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.